Um, Michal, it's 10 years since your last uh, All-Ireland final, which was Cork and Down, and given the weekend that's in it, they have a Division 3 clash between them. How do you reflect on, on the 10 years since, since that last All-Ireland final for you? Well, when you see both of them in Division 3, I know they're improving both of them. But you know, to look back then, 10 years, they were in the All-Ireland final. Mm. So it's a, a big change. But then teams recover. And Cork in particular, now I'm interested in Cork, because they were very bad for maybe two years. And then suddenly, coming towards the end last year, they won a few good matches. And they've been on a good winning mood since then. And Down, you know, they're always dangerous. I remember when Down won their first All Ireland in 1960. That in the day was, in a way, was the biggest event to then. I'd say it would nearly outdo the polo grounds in 1947. There was a lot of talk at the time about the borders. That term was used a lot that time. In terms of the football and teams In of terms borders? of the football people. Oh, they'd be over the border now. Or uh, people would be asking the question, will the Sam Maguire ever cross the border? It had never crossed until down one. Cavan won a few All-Irelands. Nearly all the Ulster finals, I remember... Cavan one time winning maybe 14 out of the 15 Ulster titles. Mm. That was the 30s, 40s years? Yes, yeah, uh, like that. no competition. Yeah. And was Sean O'Neill was the leader on that? Sean O'Neill, well he was one of the leaders mm. because they were a team of leaders. And they came from nowhere. They won their first ever Ulster title in 1959. And I still see them dashing out onto Crow Park in the semi-final against Galway. They came out on the Cusick side and they almost ran into the Hogan stand on the other side with, you know, the drive that was in them. But they were different and people used to be saying, who do they think they are? They had a little bag for their boots. Up to then most footballers arrived with the boots over the shoulder or if it would be a monster final, Kids would be carrying the boots. There's a great saying by the young kids, carry your boots. And players again would just lace his ties together, no fancy bags or anything. But Down had little things like that. They had a, uh, maybe some sort of a tracksuit. These things weren't known and they had done nothing. And some people were saying, who do they think they are? But that They're didn't fancy. worry Down. They had their plan. They had good people behind them. And that surprised everybody. They beat Kerry in that final of 1960, the first one ever. Beat Kerry in the semi-final the following year. They won again in 68, won in 91. And when they went out to play Cork, they were unbeaten in the All-Irelands they had played at it, it. I think it might have been four, in a, four 1960, 61, 68... 91, 94. Mm. You know, they, they had won all those and they'd beaten Kerry in at least all bar one, I think. Or they had beaten Kerry. And then they were back in the final again. But I remember the invasion onto the pitch in Croke Park when they won in 1960. I never saw anything like it. Really? I'm sure they didn't believe themselves, the down followers, you know. This has happened. We are the All Ireland Champions. But as I said earlier, they had a lot of leaders. Paddy Doherty was a leader, Sean O'Neill was. And then back in the backs, uh, you had the McCartan, centre forward, uh, John, full back then, or centre back, the brother. They were all strong characters mm. who said what they needed to say and so on and uh, did their own thinking. And, uh, they were a good team and they had a great spell and it did a lot because since then I have seen Donegal win in all Ireland for the first time, Derry for the first time, Armagh for the first time and Tyrone for the first time. Mm -hmm. Nothing like that has happened in any other province. And I think it all stemmed from the leadership of Down. James McCartan, you know, he was a powerful centre forward, strong man used to strength, but a great character. I knew him well, and um, I, I sometimes asked, I called up to Dan one time in his house, and I said, I have rarely seen a man as determined as you are when you were on that field. 
were you born that way? And he said, if you knew my father, you'd understand. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what would I understand? He said, we were beaten by Galway in 59. He was waiting for me out in Clanliff Road with a mini miner or something. I sat in there. He was driving the car. Until we came out to the car at that gate there looking out the window. I, said, I didn't open my mouth. I didn't get a chance. <laughs> he was saying, what in the name of God were you trying to do when you did this and when you did that? And he said, I couldn't say a word. And he said, maybe there was a lot of truth in what he was saying. I stepped out of the car, he said, in that yard out there. And he said, I put my head in the door. If I have to steal the Sam Maguire is coming in that gate next year for you to have a good look. At it. <laughs> and he said, we brought it in. And he said, I got that dry from the father, you know, urging him to be better. No, a lot of them had that, but they, they were great fun. Mm. Paddy Doherty, I used to like to see him play, and strangely, I've been out at Asian Games and things like that, and I saw this young lady playing out there one time, and oh, she was one of the Doherty's. I inquired who she was. She was so good playing, and she kept playing until her own daughter out there was playing with her. <laughs> and, yeah. what, what you said there about the McCartans and the father-son relationship, that's a story that is played out at under 10 level, 12, all the oh, yes. groups up to see Oh, it is, even though too much interference by parents until they have grown to a certain level, I don't think it's good. But just jumping back to teams that win their first All-Ireland, or I suppose even teams that kind of bridge a massive gap in terms of a famine, you know, a 30, like yeah, Limerick, oh, yeah. you know, 45 Limerick, years. Limerick, yeah. until they won recently. Mm. And it is a hurdling count. They play an awful lot of hurling in the county Limerick, and it's a big mm. county. They had only won all Ireland between 1940 and the one they won a year and a half ago now. It's mad, isn't it? A massive gap in time. Won all Ireland. And it wasn't a fair uh, indication of the strength of hurling in Limerick. They were often in hard luck, you know. And they left a few behind them, didn't they? They did, but uh, it was their own fault if they did, you know. It, you have to win them. Uh, I would say 54, 94 hit them very hard. Oh, right. And uh, the man that had a great description of that was Con Hulhead. Now, Con was a, he was a good journalist. He had freedom to do what he liked, to write about what he liked. Nobody ever told him what to write about. He did it. He'd go along. He never went into a press box. Oh? He said no, no. <clears throat> he always, put, in Croke Park now, until that stand was built in front of the canal, he always planked himself there if the game was in Croke Park. With the people who see us. The people that know. And know, would never go into that. But he was down there that year and he described it. He used to have an article in the evening press, I think. He said for 65 minutes, it must be 70 minute matches at the time. It was all good humour, joking and Limerick comfortably in top. And he said, great. And then suddenly, awfully got a goal. And a second goal. And he said, immediately it fell into total silence. When the game ended, nobody dared say anything. They would, couldn't, couldn't think of anything to say. He said, I walked in sympathy with them up to Jones's Road. That was before the stand was that air. The Offaly followers were coming the other direction, maybe getting off the hog and coming down. They too were silent, he said. And then he finished it by saying, it was only then that I understood what it meant to be dumbfounded. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that you didn't know what to say and you said nothing. And it affected both sides to such a shock. Mm -hmm. Now Limerick could have won that, but other teams could say they had won other all and That's what makes it great. You can never be sure until that whistle blows. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
I had a great time going to all the matches and getting to know players. And uh, another thing about Khan, he had tremendous sympathy for Dublin followers. And I said, why? Sure, it was very easy for them down the road. He said, that's the problem. They don't have the experience of going to an All Ireland. He'd be thinking of himself from Castle Island. And, that, and it, there's a lot of truth in that. Mm. And there were times when Con went down to Kerry on a Friday to come to the All Ireland on Saturday. You know, and he said, there is something in that. That is part of it. And he had the sympathy for the Dublin followers. They don't ever experience that. Maybe they'll facilitate them sometime and have an All Ireland in Mayo. Yeah, <laughs> or another one down in Thurles. Like another one here. down in Kerry, yeah. Is there any, um, like you mentioned, the down celebrations? Is there any All Ireland that really, really sticks out because of the explosion of joy, the ending of a famine? Is there any All Ireland that was like kind of struck you that this meant so much to them? Well, I, I, the, I, the awfully hurling, I think. The story of awfully hurling to me, uh, it's a miracle. If you look at their record before 1980, they won their first Lens in 1980. Mm -hmm. They had played in the Leinster final of 1969. And I think you'd go a hell of a long way to find them in the Leinster final before that, maybe around 1928 mm. or something. It was doldrums for most of their existence. It was, but the hope was always there. Mm. And I remember being at the semi-finals that year. Now, Kilkenny were all Ireland champions, as they often are. And uh, they had a mighty game with Wexford. Kilkenny Wexford used to be a great game that day. Mm. And awfully beat Leash. Now, I happened to call out to the hospital in Adelaide Road that night to visit somebody. And I met two of the awfully hurlers inside. Paddy Delaney was one of them, and I think Kennedy, Mick Kennedy, who was a priest, is a priest. He was there, and there was a third there. And you wouldn't talk her, yeah. And I started talking all the time about the great game between Wexford and Ireland. Now, after a while, Paddy Delaney said to me, did you see us at all? <laughs> <laughs> he was a great role, you know. And I said, I didn't really, because I had to be searching out for the teams that would line out in the second half. And he said then, and I thought again, it was a joke, don't write us off. The Lancers fine. Now I was broadcasting that Lancers fine. Only eight thousand and a few hundred turned up for an event that usually attracted Kilkenny Wexford would always have at least thirty thousand. Mm. The Olympic Games were on in Moscow and people stayed at home to watch the games. But uh, it was a great game of hurling, and it was won in the end by Offaly. Now that was to me a miracle. Not alone that then, but the aftermath. There was 20 years left in this century. They played in 11 consecutive Leinster finals. That was another mini miracle. Mm -hmm. They won seven of them. For a county that hadn't won any, they won seven of the 11. And Wexford and Kilkenny were good that time, and Dublin used to be too bad at times. And in that spell, they won four all Ireland. Now, that was very impressive. Now, it is a pity that they have gone back down. And I hope they come again, but they have a, a good explanation. They no longer have a young population. At that time, Bordenamon was a big thing. Mm. There was a lot of ESB employment there as well. But those things have been receding ever since, you know, and nearly gone. So they no longer have a young generation, but I hope they'll come again. Now, occasions like that, you know, I, I like them to say, I would love now to see Mayo win in all Ireland. They deserved one, but there's no, no certificate or anything going with, with losing one. And uh, it was great when Donegal won. Mm. First time ever. They hadn't won many Lens Ulsters. They won their first, I think, 1972 around then. And they were never, and uh, there was a joke 
around Kerry for a while, you know, long before that. Uh, Dingle fishermen used to go all the way up the western coast and they knew the fishermen of Killybegs and all those. And um, there's a story which is always told around Dingle that somebody asked Paddy Bourne Brosnan, he was a Kerry footballer, he was a fisherman, strong as three horses put together, you know. Somebody asked him, what's it like now to, when you're getting the San Maguire Cup? If we ever get it, what will we do? Well, have your hand out to shake hands with the Queen. We've no Queen here. You will by the time ye win and all that. <laughs> there was that, but there were a good relationship between mm. Kerry and Donegal, the, the relation of the sea. Now they won, uh, they won in 1992, Down had won in 1991. And I was up at a few of their games, I knew a lot of them, lots of them used to play in different clubs and come out the and the Gael Gigas. Be me she kind girl, give Martin McHugh and the brother of us uh, on Cup Day and the whole lot of them. Mm. And I went up as I often did when they had reached the final. I would go to the county, especially if it was a county that would never be for it. To soak it in? Pardon? Just to soak it in? the atmosphere Just to up. see, I believed in, in seeing and listening and looking yourself. And I left very, you know, late, maybe on a Monday evening, settled in somewhere. And it was a lovely morning, the Tuesday. And I had the golf clubs in the car. I keep them in the car always. They're good to balance the car, you know. And <laughs> they go right across. <laughs> so it was a lovely morning, and I hit down to the, the golf club of Nairn and Port New. Lovely place, really. Went into the bar and there were three people inside talking about the match. And one or two of them knew me and they knew that Kerry had won all else. And they started bamboozling me with questions. What's it like when you see your county run out onto the field? And a whole lot of questions. We decided to go playing golf. And right through the game, it was question after question. They were really in a final, and that was huge. But they had no knowledge of what happens in the next bit. What's it like when you see your team, green and gold, running out onto the field? And I was toning everything down a little bit, because I thought they had no hope of beating mm. Dublin, really. Dublin, that was the year after the year of the great four matches with me and Dublin were a lot better the following year but anyway we finished the round we did drop a tea and I was heading off so it's a time mission is you don't get a guide over good in guy that has been my kind in Shilladina and I shook hands with them and as I shook hands with the last of them one of them said I suppose the four of us will never again meet and I said, if Donegal win on Sunday, I'll be back here at 10 o'clock on Tuesday morning and I want the three of you here. And I, we shook hands again. Yeah. <laughs> and I headed off for me, though, saying to myself, I wouldn't say it to anyone else, the four of us will never again meet. But as it turned out, I was broadcasting the game and it was a most enjoyable game and they won it, playing good football, they won it. And then I was looking forward to meeting those, but late on the Sunday night I went out to Malahide, the Grand Hotel in Malahide, that's where they, where they were um, celebrating. And it was thronged, as you can imagine. Yeah. Uh, First ever win, of course. Donegal people came from everywhere, and why wouldn't they be delighted, singing the lot? And I was walking up the middle of the hall late at night. I wanted to meet those of them I didn't meet after the game. And halfway up the hall, I got a little tip on the shoulder, turned around, and here was one of the three I had met <laughs> the previous Tuesday. And he was attempting to say something. And there was a lot of noise and it was hot. And I eventually picked up what he was trying to say was, 
could you ever make it 12 o'clock? <laughs> he was a, a little bit unsteady in the feet. As I, so I said, 12 o'clock is fine for me. And I was there. I went up on the Monday when the cup was coming home. And I stood on the border between Leitrim, or is it Sligo, one or other of them, into Bundor. That's where the bus stopped then they were much later than they thought you could understand that and uh, the captain Anthony Malloy and the manager and Brian McIniff they came out with the Sam Maguire because there was a huge crowd there and it was only a mile into Bundoran and then Anthony Malloy said to me Neil Tussa you're not going into this you're not uh, we're not leaving here until you come into this bus with us and I took, you know, the invitation and in there and what a night it was, you know, and we had our game of golf, the next, I didn't meet the other three till the next yeah. day, they were waiting, but this time I was playing silently because they didn't stop, did you see this, do you remember, <laughs> and you know, it is great to see that, a new experience for them, I loved occasions like that, and mm. uh, uh, they come now and again. It's time we hit another first timer. Mm -hmm. I might make a, a comeback, as they say. The comeback was when you were out of football at hurling, maybe for more than a year, and you might be asked to come back. And they just come back. I remember me picked a man at midfield for the All Ireland final of 1949. They're first and they won it, and they played him at midfield, and he hadn't played in a year. So um, comebacks, <laughs> that was the line. So I never took myself too seriously, mm -hmm. but I had great fun looking forward. That's a great thing, looking forward to it, you know, and the time and the enjoyment of meeting people and then the wonder and the doubt and all the things that can happen, you know. Did you ever have a final where it was so exciting and irrespective of whether it was Kerry or not. And like you were, you in, were involved in training Mikko's team at one stage. Oh, I was. Well, well, those that lived in Dublin, they would yeah. be students. I had a good few of them. But did you ever, whether it's a Kerry team or watching some other teams that are you know, unrelated to you, just found yourself so excited and wrapped up in a game, you were almost wondering, am I getting too carried away with myself? Or could you always control yourself? Well, no, I was always conscious of the fact from meeting people. My job and any commentator job is to talk about what is happening. But it must be tough. Not what you would like to see happen. Yeah. That has no place there. And there'd be two sets or maybe three sets of audiences, the followers of each, and then there'd be a good block of people who come to see a match. They're not too worried to win. You must be fair to all those and as fair as you can to the... Uh, to the players, you know, and you, you can, anyone can make mistakes. Mm. And um, that's the way I looked at it, enjoy the thing. The thing is that you have no clue starting what's going to happen. I think that makes it better even. And mm. They're usually very exciting and so on. That game now, the last time that Down and Cork were in a, in a big game, that was 2010 when Cork won 16 to 15 and uh, that was a good game as well because Cork do not have as many All-Irelands as they they could have in football. Mm. And there were three down at half-time in that game. Oh, they were. They do, were. You, do you remember, like, so you would have known that that was your last All-Ireland final at the time. Do you remember having any particular emotions about that even towards the end of the game realising this is the last one I'll do? Well, that didn't, I was always going to a match and looking forward to the match. And that's the, the one thing that's special about being a commentator or journalist. When you retire, you'll still go hmm. and you'll see the scenes that you saw there similar before. And that's a good thing. If you retire now as a banker or a teacher or a guard or anything like that, you don't meet the people you usually associate with except at the Christmas dinner. Mm -hmm. So it was easier. I said, now I'll go to all the matches, as many matches as I can. Keep going. There's no change except now there's somebody else doing the talking and it's easy to get people that are well capable of doing it. And 
I had done it in eight decades. I was there in the 40s, right through to 2010, which was the start of another decade. Right. So I broadcast in eight decades, which was a, an unusual thing, but what was amazing how quickly they went. And, and who did you broadcast the last game with? Who was the Well, it was the uh, Australian Rules. Oh, yeah. That was played in October. Mm. So that uh, I had great trips with those as well, and they're still going on. But I think the Australians, they might be getting a bit tired of them. You wouldn't know that's a professional game, you know. And it's played during their holidays, during their break. Mm. And a lot of people like their break, but they still turn out and bring big crowds and so on. Do you, do you remember um, first getting an interest in Gaelic football? Of course. Well, no anyone in Kerry was always interested. But do you remember the first time and it started to make sense to you that I enjoy kicking this football around and the competitive element? Yeah, well, when I was young, I was born in 1930, and there was a great era of dingle football developing. That they had never won a county before. And they won then their first in 1938, beating them their first final the year before. And they went on to win five or six then, and the few captains from West Kerry. That was a great time to get involved in it. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, one thing about training nowadays, when I see all the training going on nowadays, up to the 1950s, training was not a big issue. A lot of people that time were working manually. Fishermen, farmers, a lot of, lot of work done. People were physically strong. They didn't need as much training. But as things changed, training developed its own life. Mm -hmm. And it's get bigger and wider and uh, complicated than ever. But I suppose it's a good thing. The one big difference that I have seen if I meet players now tomorrow, we'll say, or next Sunday, that gave up playing hurling and football three or four years ago, they will be in much better physical shape than their equivalents would have been 10, 20 years ago. Because it is bred into them now a consciousness of your own fitness. And I think they're advised by trainers and managers we give out about them and physiotherapists and all that that this is something that will benefit you for life if you follow certain rules. The modern retired player is still a fit man for a good number of years. And that's a great development. Before they used to go out of shape quickly. Because there was nobody, you know, preaching. So a lot of change, but they come on you by, de by degrees. Mm. And there's a natural inclination in all of us to be against something. And I say, give everything a chance. You never know. And lots of changes have come. What, what sort of a footballer were you? Well, I was never a great footballer. I had bad knee for one thing. My great moment was I scored three goals one day for the Geraldines in Dublin against, uh, I think, to a Sagart. Or St Mary's, yes, yeah, St Mary's of Sagart. Yeah. Do you remember what sort of goals they were? Great goals. <laughs> <laughs> Top corner. But I, I'll tell you now what a, another question. Uh, you know, it's great to meet people that, that have a, you know, the, the good way of putting things. Somebody met this guy in Monday and said, Michal got three goals yesterday. I read in something. And the other fellow replied, Oh God, I have terrible sympathy for the poor gold man. And uh, the other guy said, why? Didn't I see him in a window on O'Connell Street this morning making baskets? <laughs> the peop blind people were employed that time to sit in windows weaving and making <laughs> baskets. He said, I saw the poor gold <laughs> this morning in a window on O'Connell Street. And uh, I, th that's having a bit of fun, which, yeah. which is good. Yeah. And how did you end up, so obviously your, your voice is very famous and, and, you know, for being soothing, relaxing voice right. and, and ideal well, for... Well, I was, I was lucky, you know, I knew the players and 
there was a good team in RTE that time, you know, in the, in the sports department, you know, and we... Who opened the door for you to, to get into it, to first commentate? Well, they had trialed. They, um, that would be 1949, the year mm. I started. A, a little notice that appeared. I was in the teacher training college at the time. And it was from Radio Air, it was known as that time. Mm. What's now Radio Television. When that started in the 20s, it was known as 2RN. Mm. And that was really meant, the letter 2 was there and then RN, but that was meant to be to earn. Ah, okay. But no, but to, to, <laughs> you wouldn't think of that straight away. But that started in 1926, and then maybe around the mid-30s it became Radio Earn. And it was a, a fogra from those that on the following Sunday they'd be holding trials in Croke Park for in search of a commentator that would do matches through the medium of Irish. Sean O'Sheekhorn used to do an odd one in Irish that time. But he was, I think, involved internally in the GA from then on and he wanted and he was a great singer and he wanted more time for Croke Park, his job at the time, and uh, they had this four granny and invited everyone to come down, style five I think, admission free, come in under the Hogan stand. The same notice appeared in other places and people came from a good few places and we were all in there and uh, in turn we were given a piece of paper, the teams, two club teams. And I looked upon it as an adventure, you know, we, I have great fun here. It was a great privilege to get into me hollow O'Hare's box. It was a little box between the old Hogan which only went half ways around and the long stand, which was a standing place, there were no seats in it. That was the box, to get in there. And I went in there and I said, no, I'd have great fun. Everyone was getting five minutes. And I knew one person. There were hurdlers. It was the first hurdling match I ever saw. And I had a great day describing all the imaginary things one of them was doing and having great fun to myself. And I was there for about 10 to 15 minutes. And when I came in, I was asked, would I broadcast the Railway Cup final? I think it was the following Thursday. It used to be in St. Patrick's Day, and that could be any day of the week. And it was Thursday. So I, I broadcast that, and it was a, a draw. Munster and Leinster, I think, 2-7 apiece. Were you nervous? I was too young to be nervous. How old were you? That would be, uh, I was 18. So you were probably in college at that point? I was in the college in Drumcon, yeah. in my first year, really. And, um, well, this was 50, we were gone into 59 to be, uh, so I was still 18, and um, I did the match and enjoyed it no end. This I, I knew a lot of these. There was six Kerry men on and six from Cork, and, Packy Brennan from Tipperary came on. It was a big thing to be a Tipperary man. Uh, Mick Cahill, he was a great player with Tipperary at the time, finished up playing with Cork. He was playing that day as well, and uh, a Clare player thrown in. And it, was, it was a good game, ended in a draw, decided to replay on Sunday. Leinster wouldn't near home, they all went home, maybe did some bit of training. The Kerry lads and the Cork lads stayed around and they had a marvellous weekend. But it is still the biggest winning margin ever in the Railway Cup. The trouncing that that monster team gave to Leinster in the replay. Much. I was by, oh, they beat them something like 4-7 to 1-4 or something oh, like that. A question I had is, back then, were there recordings? So could you listen back to the broadcast you did no. to sort of learn? No. So, and you wouldn't think it was there anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because you know when you hear your voice in a recording, yeah. it's very different to how it yeah. sounds in your own head. Yeah. So you had no opportunity to even listen back. And I had like Well, I did in this sense. The dean of the college recorded it on a machine. And uh, he told me that he had it and to drop into his office the following day and that he'd play it. I did hear it that way. Right. And what did you think of it? Well, 
I, you wouldn't know what to think of it, really, because it's strange to hear yourself. Isn't it, yeah. It's very unnerving. But that's how it's that, and I've often said that an awful lot of things in life start by chance. Chance is what, yeah. Mm. And did you meet, how quickly did you meet Michal O'Hare? And did oh, I met him uh, that day. Now, he used to always do the first game on Patrick's Day. Be it, and they used to alternate, have the hurling first one year, the next year to be the football. Mm. Whatever the first match, he always did it. Because he was a journalist with the Independent at the time, as well as being the RTE commentator. But not an awful lot of games were being broadcast at mm. that time. No question of broadcasting league games or anything. But uh, he would have to be, there used to be a big meet, it was the opening of the, the flat year, Patrick's Day, out in Baldoy. And he do the first game and dash out to, put, to do the uh, infield broadcast out there for the racing ball. Mm. So I met him that day and I met him many a time afterwards. And uh, he was a great, a great character, you know. His wife was some Mayo. He'd always a, a great friendship with Mayo people, and uh, oh, he was a long time there, and he was different to all others. Did he in in influence your style? Uh, no, I always decided what way I do it, mm -hmm. and I think that's the way. That's the way everything should be. That you shouldn't try to be imitating anyone, because you'll be thinking, "What would he have said here?" It's better to do your own thinking and react to what you're seeing and. Hope that you get most of it right. And do you think that you changed massively as a commentator over the years? Well, not deliberately. Yeah. But I remember one time going down to um, people. Who, I remember now getting the subs and everything the particular day. It was a Railway Cup match. Uh, and I was down in Cork maybe a week later and I called up to the Finbars Club. They had new premises and everything. After a while, someone said, Gerald McCarthy plays here. I said, I know he does. You didn't always know. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He came on as a sub last Sunday. And you would call him a different name, which I was, because the, whoever was in our team gave me the list and the numbers everyone would have. He came on with the wrong number on mm. and that's the, and he wasn't long. Yeah, the spectator is never long um, reminded I, I didn't know what he was trying to tell me for a while. He said, Gerald McCarthy plays here. Another friend say he's one of us, you know, Gerald. Mm. Everyone knows Gerald. And then I should I know Gerald. You didn't always know him. <laughs> <laughs> they, they'd remind you, but they, I, I wouldn't mind that. Yeah. How, how different is journalism from when you started out? to let's say when you finished up and then I'll ask you up till, till right now even the last 10 years but how much did it change for you? Well I think at, at that time and the early years anyway you spoke from start to the match to the finish and at times you spoke through the half time mm. and uh, there were no analysts so to, it was yourself now you'd have somebody to keep the scores because I'd be writing a report afterwards, you know, and you would know afterwards now at what time exactly did that goal come that turned it and so on. So, but uh, you had to keep going and see as much as you can and give as much information as you can to the audience. Mm. And then when you finished up, how different were your duties? Well, I still go into the matches. Last weekend now uh, I was down on Saturday night in Tralee to see Galway and Kerry play in the league game. And I was down in Newbridge the following day then when Fermanagh were playing Kildare. Yeah. So I think going to the matches is good and mm. keeping in touch. Was, was more of a, expected of you within your job towards the, let's say, 2010 versus when you started out in 1948, did you say? Was, it, was there very different expectations and kind of do you know, just the amount of things you had to do on a game day, or was it more or less similar? Well, it was much different in the early days. For instance, you could walk, you'd be welcome in any dressing room. Mm. By degrees then, once managers came, 
they didn't want that. They didn't even want their county selectors to be in there, maybe unless they're involved with the team. And I think that was going too far. You know, I often had discussions, and it mightn't be about the match at all with somebody, something that he was interested in always. And, but uh, that rule wasn't there in my time. It was beginning. Mm. It was beginning. It's just taken full control <laughs> You wouldn't dream of even contacting a player no, with a but top I, I always went down, you know, to see the teams coming in, coming off the bus. To get a sense you, you, of could, you could read them, or you think you could read them. And it was a help, you know. Mm. You know, were they, do they look like men that are ready? Are they too casual? You know, but you you could be wrong, but you'll get an opinion on it, mm. and you you could give that. So, what do you think about the, you know, the punditry? We'll say the Sunday game and yeah. how players are reviewed. Maybe sometimes it gets a bit personal, that type of thing. Yeah. What's your your thoughts on on how that has evolved over the years, the punditry side of things? Well, it's it just somebody had an idea. We'll try this. Have another angle to it. There's nothing wrong with that, and people look forward to it. They mightn't agree with all the things they hear. Players mightn't agree. Um, it mightn't always, but it's nearly always right. But uh, the character of the person comes out a lot. You, you know, some say something, might be a small thing, for a reaction. And they'd be wondering, I wonder now, if people come to blows over this or not. Now, it's an addition. Hmm. Maybe there's over-analysis. Do you mean stats and this type of thing? Yes. Hmm. Yeah, they're there, but then that's the way the world of sport is going in all sports. and Give it a trial, a fair trial. Uh, you know, the black card. And I remember when cards were given out first. I think it was Weeshy, Fogarty, Down and Kerry. They used to... It was always a time you'd get an idea of what will Kerry be like this year on the the June bank holiday, I think. They'd have a game, they'd invite a good team to Killarney. And at that time, people were talking about God, and he, he was giving cards. Give those out now to people, this, that. But he never felt happy with it, and he gave nobody a card until towards the end. <laughs> <laughs> he showed us the old person, and... Uh, it was dropped then, came again, and sure, the num the colours of cards now. <laughs> the black one as well. But then their developments, they're all worth the trial. Mm. But uh, they should be looked upon, you know, correctly. You have a good talk about them before you you establish them. Mm. But the it's always good to be looking forward, and I'm looking forward now to how the league will finish. How will the championship start and who will be lifting, whether it's the McCarthy Cup and Hurling or the Samuel Cup in Irish. Do you, do Cork you know? are amazing. They won their first football title, I think it was in 1900. And they won again in... Uh, was it they won it in 19 yeah they won it in they didn't win did they win the hurling in 2000 i think they did the hurling was 2000 i think or was it kilkenny did they win yeah. it in 99 yeah i mixed them mixed them up oh in 99 yeah but they they repeated that Tipperary did a thing it was never done before or since is that winning in every decade no, they won two, the two All Irelands on the one day. First finals to be played in Croke Park, those of 1995. The finals weren't played until maybe March of the following year. But Tipperary won the hurling and the football. And the same man refereed both games, and he refereed the long puck and the long kick as well. So things have changed. Yeah. And they were the first all Ireland to be played in Croke Park. And Tipperary won the double. 
which I'm glad to, I'm yeah. happily talk yeah. about that. Yeah. Uh, do you think Gaelic football is in a good place? Are you still enjoying, well, are you enjoying what it's become yeah. and where it's going? Well, um, I don't like to see what you'd call the, the slow passages that develop. Passing across the field. Running down the clock, as they say. Mm. You know, to me, that's not playing football. No people, nobody goes to a match to see that or to look forward to that. They look forward to contests. And I was disappointed that they kick out, that they didn't make a rule that has to go beyond the 45. And seeing that it's kicked out from the 13 out shouldn't take a mighty kick mm. from the length of the field that people can kick them nowadays. But a few things, but otherwise hurling is going well and I think there was a, a better edge to the football last year and I think it will be better this year again, that this mass defence will, will die. Mm. Do you think Kerry can do well, it this year? they'll always be trying. Yeah. They, last year now, um, 11 of them were playing in their first big final in Croke Park. That was a big thing. They had only one year's training. You never can train up to the level of 70 minute matches without having more. They'll have that bit extra this year, but so will the other teams. And that Kerry team got two in the space of, in a short space of time, oh, yeah. so that'll speed up their development too. If you were to if you were to put your head on the block, would you be thinking Dublin will do six in a row or can Well carriers? there'll be no pressure on Dublin for this reason. Nobody ever has done six in a row. Their manager will have pressure though, because he 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 himself will want to win and, you know, put his own stamp on it. And of not course he much. will, but he'll get a second chance if he yeah. doesn't get it then. Or they will be effective. They were very good the last year. They have a big panel and a good discipline, good plans. Now, it's great to be looking forward, mm. no matter who wins in the finish. And in the Hurland side of things, you, you had fancy I, for Limerick. I have a fancy for Limerick. Yeah. They went so long when they didn't get their fair share. It was their own fault, of course. They didn't win. You have to win. I think there's another one in them. Would you have a favourite player in, in either code of all time, of all the players you've watched? Well, I suppose Chris Steering would have to remain the hurler, still. Because it's so hard for someone who... You know, we'd have only seen clips, his skills video, you know, a oh, beautiful yes. striker. Oh, sure, there was no television. He, uh, yeah, It's almost unrelatable for yeah. someone of my age. But, like, what was so special? But he about? rarely, well, he had all the skills. And he was driven. There was nothing higher in life to him than hurling. Be it club or county or province. He was that driven. He won a minor All-Ireland in 1938, I think. And was his brother told me this. He was picked as a right half-back. And very early in the game, they got a 21. And he wasn't the designated free taker. And he ran up and told the guy that was getting ready to take to get out of the way. <laughs> That's the way. And, um, and the brother, Willie, said to me, and he scored a point to go a goal, a goal of course. And he was that way all his life. He had this supreme confidence in his own. But he was senior in 39. Can you imagine? I broadcast the final of the Railway Cup hurling match of 1963. And Chris Deering was still there on the Munster team winning his 18th Railway Cup medal. Crazy. And he hardly missed a challenge game and all that. He had the skills, he was a tough man when he had to, but he was driven by hurling and he had great respect for people that would stand up to him and all that. And himself and Mick Mackey were rivals. and The famous photo. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And what was he like as a person to chat to? Well, he was, he was a quiet, reserved man. He was... Um, Later on, when he became a selector, you know, he was he was a bit more open. Mm. But he was still Chris Deering, who was the king. 
Could anyone compare with him in Hurling? Ah, they could, sure. It's the, the amount of fantastic hurlers we have seen. Eddie Kerr and DJ Carey and, you know, from every county, Joe Canning and the West. There are so many of them. If you sat down to make a list of them, you could pick three teams of great hurlers. Mm. It's a great game. There's no game in the world like hurling to me. And, and who in football then, who would have been the player of all the players that you loved watching the most? No, people often mention Sean Purcell of Galway and Mickey O'Connell of Kerry. Who used to row back to Valencia Island? He used, yeah. He was, they were different. They had the skills. They could play anywhere. And uh, they didn't believe in fouling. But there were others as good as them, you know, but people happened to pick those out. Jack O'Shea played in eight all Ireland finals at midfield and won seven of them and won three under twenty ones in a minor. So and you'd you'd get them another Anthony Tohill, you could you could go around the country and you'd get their equivalent. But Sean Purcell was he had a great style. They all had the good style, the good player. Hmm. And his first coach ever was a nun. <laughs> Go away. How did that happen? I don't know, but he was always at me that nun. She'd have me out there throwing the ball to <laughs> Who, Who's your favourite players right now in the current game? Uh, there, there, are, there, are, there are lots of them. And uh, Kilkenny, Kieran Kilkenny on the double team. Seems to be getting better, doesn't he? He's getting better. I know him because... Uh, uh, we speak Irish every time we meet, that's one of the things. And he went to Australia, got an invitation to Australia. And I think what he made, he was doing well, but he suddenly came home. And I, I never asked him. I think he came home, he was missing the football, he was missing the hurdler, he's a great hurdler. He was missing the gael and the music. There was a lot of things maybe in his head uh, rather than football on its own. Hmm. I think that's why he came home. He's a good player and uh, there's a lot of good players. John Fenton, he's a great player on the Dublin team. Oh, he's Brian a, Fenton? Brian Fenton, yeah. Brian Fenton. There was a John Fenton that he was playing for. The Cork Hurlers. Cork, Cork, and he was a good one. Yeah. He was a good one. That goal he pulled on. Oh yes, incredible yeah. stuff. Way out, way out the field. Yeah, I, I was at the game. I was brought to casting that game. And because the camera angle, you're, I think you're, if you watch it back, you're almost unsure what what happened there. Oh yes, at the time it must because have been amazing to watch. The it. ball had hit the net before the. You didn't see the ball. You saw the net shaking, but you didn't see the ball for another little spell. Mm. Yeah. It's like that Jimmy Barry Murphy goal when. Was it Fenton again who drove in a, a, a ball just kind of head height and he dived or he flicked it? Oh, yeah. And it was, you'd have to watch the replay a few times oh, yeah. to see it back. Um, a current hurler? Is there any current hurler who really kind of... Uh, Joe Canning, in yeah. a way. He, he plays well every day. He's a commanding figure. He's a quite reserved man on the field and off the field and loves hurling, you know. And he's back again now and it's good to see him back. But there are lots of them and... Uh, you know, Tipperary have a good few. Mm. And uh, Cork got coming. You know, the, uh, who's the who's the captain this year? For Cork? Yeah. Uh, is it Horgan? Horgan, yeah. Horgy, they call him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, he began as a good free taker. And then he began to be good at scoring points. And over the past two years, he's scoring frees, points and goals, you know, and he's captain. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, there'll be a big effort from Cork this year, but it's all, it's all waiting. And uh, a final question then, um, what's your favourite thing about GA, or could you sum up your love for it over the years? Well, uh, uh, to listen to the players, you'd understand that. They always have great respect for their club. And you know, they talk, I started with the club, I'll possibly finish with the club. Only for the club I wouldn't be there. And I think that's the greatest thing, the link that there's between the players and their home place. And that doesn't go. So I think that's stronger than ever now. And they'll be all getting ready and hopes are high. It's good to be hopeful. Sure is. Thank Even you. though at the finish. <laughs>
<laughs> and people will see through it, yeah, we'll be wiser the next time. They'll recover quickly. Mm. Thank you very much, Michal. Appreciate it. Cash galore, yeah. Thanks for watching our game. Don't forget to like and share the videos. And if you're new to the channel, hit subscribe.